the, the Shanghai World Financial Center, uh, I, I remember the first time I saw a drawing of it was probably 1997. And uh, this project has really been kind of a moving target for you and then it began construction and then it stopped and then the client said we want it taller. Uh, have you ever worked a project like that before? Is this the new normal in, uh, in architectural design? You're talking about the change in height or the, yes, the delay or both? All of the above. Well, the delay was unusually long. Uh, I, uh, and it, it had to do more with the, the market in, in the late 90s being oversaturated or at least too, many, too much vacant space. And Mr. Marty decided it wasn't a good time to build, and so he stopped construction. Uh, I don't know, was it both the city and, uh, and Mr. Moore decided to make the building larger? Well, but you couldn't change the foundations, they were already built. So the, the building the building rests on uh, piles which are grown uh, 90 meters down into this uh, soupy soil that they have. There. A thousand feet of mud. And uh, so uh, the challenge of taking a building from 460 meters to 492 meters, Mr. Moore wanted to build it 500 meters. The city didn't want to get to the 500 meter uh, mark. So, uh, they had wanted it larger or taller, but not as tall as Mr. Moore. And uh, so then, as a result, the, the floor plates needed to get larger as well. To make a long story short, we're putting a much heavier building on a foundation that was designed for a lighter building. Well, how much, how much of the drawings and the design had been done when they said, OK, we want it taller? I mean, it wasn't simply a matter of adding more floors. The building had been completely structured. It was ready for construction. It was in construction. All the piles had been placed. And the construction was going to proceed. And then it was stopped in, I believe, 1997. And so the Leslie Robertson came in at that point and took over the new assignment as a structural engineer. He came in uh, and his wife, Satine C. And they took a building that was of one weight at 460 uh, meters in height and essentially created the same weight but a much larger building wow. <laughs> with a lighter structure. They did that. The columns don't touch the foundations. Doctor. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, the weight doesn't count. <laughs> see here. I'm going to take a breather. What else do you want to talk about as far as Shanghai World Financial Center? Are we pretty much there? Well, I think the interesting thing uh, would be aspects of its uh, uh, safety, security, and the manner in which the building is structured, because I think everybody that we talk to is always interested in that as a result of 9-11, and uh, how, how is that dealt with in the, in the, with the Chinese code and, and with this specific structure? Because their code is much stricter than ours. Really, what what is that like? I can say well, one uh, the the core in this case is, is uh, at some points four feet of concrete reinforcing and reinforcing steel reinforcing, which encloses the elevator stairs and so forth. Which compared to the not in the World Trade Center in New York, which had steel frame and sheetrock, would be much better guard against any of the major problems that was caused by 9/11. But more important than that, they have uh, refuge floors, which are not used for any other function than gathering during an emergency, which are fireproof, have their own uh, air conditioning, tele you know, telephone communications, et cetera. Uh, and they occur about every 13 floors in the building. Um, it's hard to imagine a US developer giving up usable space at that ratio. And, uh, but it allows for people to be pre-assigned in case of any emergency to a given rest refuge floor. And then they're evacuated in a very orderly way. Uh, in what is, a, I think, a very safe core uh, for the stairs and elevators. They also have firemen's lift, which is true around most of the world, but not in America. Uh, more action stairs than we have. So and from a safety point of view, they have a lot more elements that make it a very safe building, in not just anticipation of 9-11 type of problem, but enormous winds, earthquake possibilities, things of that sort, fire that you could have emergencies. People can evacuate that building in a very orderly and safe way. I think that's important. Well, and I, I guess the structural system of the building is drastically different than the World Trade Center. Right. Well, yes. Same structural engineer. But, uh, right. Uh, many years later. Many years later. And the, uh, 
The refuge floors, in our case, they're every 13 floors. By Chinese code, they're required every 15 floors. So we exceed the, essentially exceed the code uh, with it. Uh, but the refuge floors provide an ideal opportunity to create great trusses that span from the core to the outside structural disclosure. Uh, and it gives you a full depth without interrupting a usable office floor. But the, and so that has basically created the That's structural true. efficiency of the building, utilizing that full floor depth every 13 floors to create what they call outrigger trusses that go out to the perimeter of the You're building. Great person. So that gave, gave an extremely efficient bracing system. But there are other aspects. Uh, first of all, um, the, there, as Gene has referred to, the fireman's lifts. There are three fireman's lifts within the building. There are two elevators which are utilized to go to the up to the observation floors that can be used in case of emergency to go down to each one of these refuge floors. And so we have five elevators that are they're totally dedicated to the possibility of evacuating people let alone the elevators for the basic service of the building. Well, the difference between a, a regular passenger elevator and a fireman's lift is what? The it's size. The size, it's weight carrying capacity. And it, you, you can make people in stretchers down. You can put 50, do. 60 people in one of these lifts. And, the, and it, they, they rise within a minute to the very time. You know, there's an elevator that takes you to the, to the top uh, the floor that we were discussing the observation deck. 66 seconds, one room. You don't even move, feel the elevator moving. So I was going to say, is that significantly faster than elevators in other buildings, other tall buildings? I believe it is because 66 seconds to climb more than 1,600 feet is a pretty amazing speed. Well, and I, without any movement, you do not feel any shudder. The only thing is your ears might pop. It well, I, I remember that um, reading about elevators in Japan, for example, that the Japanese have a very much uh, different personal tolerance for being. Uh, speed it up and slow down, you know, accelerated and decelerated than Americans do. Uh, and it's kind of amazing to hear that you really don't feel anything in those other things. I didn't do it. I've been there several times. So. Did you go? No, I didn't, I didn't do it. But the, the, this, the audience here is, uh, is a very diverse audience. You know, people from all over the world are going to experience these elevators. And so the, uh, the, the lesser tolerance of those Americans that may ride, uh, it needs to be accommodated as well. The, the Japanese contractors came over and installed those rails, so they're absolutely perfect. So they really do. It's a quite an amazing ride. The, the difference, you, you have dealt with the Chinese, you have dealt with Donald Trump, uh, you have dealt with the city of Chicago. I mean, there's, there's a spectrum of, uh, of clients and personalities. Dealing with the Chinese, uh, any big difference than dealing with anyone else, any, anyone else in the world? Good question. Uh, it's hard to generalize because not all the clients are the same, but we've had great, we're, we're first of all, with a lot of offshore Chinese clients in China, from Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, elsewhere. Um, and, the, and the Chinese clients we work with who are, say, in Beijing, who are native, uh, have all been, I would say in general, excellent clients who really want to do quality buildings, who care about the building, care about the users, and we enjoy, I, mean, I think we've enjoyed working with just about every one of them. Uh, so in general, Chinese clients would rank very high in my book, uh, as, long as, as well as Japanese clients, uh, who also demand quality. It's interesting, they don't share with you the budget. You know, in America, you start out, and the budget's a very big thing. But to my, my experience, it's been they don't discuss it. If they feel the building is too expensive, they'll ask you to make some changes. But you're not working against them. You know, like two hundred dollars a square foot or some such number, and it gives you a chance to explore and to show them exciting schemes and, and solutions that might you might not show if the budget had been very prominent in your mind. And I think that leads to some really very excellent buildings. Given that the Chinese economic system is, of course, radically different than America's and Western capitalism, um, you would think that maybe the rules were different there in terms of. Uh, doing business and what you had to deal with in terms of budget and money they had to spend. Now, I've talked to people about Dubai, which of course is the energy center of the world, which is where all of our dollars seem to be going. Mm -hmm. And they have their sensibilities too, and it's not a carte blanche situation where you can do whatever you want. Uh, the Chinese situation, uh, even though the economic rules are different over there, uh, the basic rules in terms of being on budget and uh, the constraints that you have on you are the same as anywhere else. Well, this, uh, Mr. Roy uh, 
is Japanese and it was our client for the World Financial Center. Mr. Moore is, has a, a very deep philosophy about he, what he wants his buildings to accomplish in the city, as we've already discussed. But Mr. Moore is also a wonderful businessman, and he uh, wants his buildings to be extremely efficient, extremely economical. And this building, um, and one of the aspects of the building that I think is extremely important is what one might refer to as embodied energy. In other words, the energy that it takes to, to actually manufacture the components of the building itself. And we believe that this is where our building is extraordinarily efficient from a sustainable point of view because it's highly efficient in terms of the amount of surface area we have per enclosed square foot. The actual surface itself is in many respects, quite similar to 333 Wacker Drive, which is our most efficient exterior wall. Uh, a, a beautiful wall, but not an expensive wall. And the same is true in the Shanghai building as well. Everything in the Shanghai building is evaluated very rigorously by them for cost. And so that was the primary challenge, but it was also something that was in the building's form enabled us to do an economical building and still create a beautiful structure. Yeah. And just so I can clarify what I said, that's not that they're not concerned about cost. They don't start out by putting your budget down. They look at this, you explore ideas, and then as you're working with them, uh, they're very content. They will help to manage the process to keep the building on a budget they obviously have in mind. But they don't make, it's not about you've got to meet this budget or else. They will be very open about design ideas. And, but they care about their quality, they care about being efficient. And they're good developers, they're solid, and Bill's right. Mr. Mari, most of them are very good business people. And so they do care about the end product being one that they can make. Well, in, in business, business is business anywhere in the world. Yeah. And, and you still have to hit your marks, whether you're dealing with yeah. you know, Donald Trump or uh, Dubai or China. That's correct. Right. <laughs> um, let me take a breath here. Uh, two of your other big projects in the world today, um, the International Commerce Center in Hong Kong, uh, beautiful building. Uh, tell me a little of the history of that one. That was a competition. We competed against four architects. Three of Three of architects, yes. And uh, it was quite clear that the developer wanted to build very efficient building. So we started with that premise. And we worked with Leslie Robertson at the very beginning in this kind of design. And we looked at a whole series of types, shape types, that, that how could we create the greatest, greatest efficiency for that building. And so um, the building is a product of, of initially, again, as the building in Shanghai was, of doing an extremely efficient building, but at the same time, we then created uh, an amplification of, of the form of that building through the texture of its surface, uh, through the manner in which it sort of flows out of the ground, because I looked at I looked at Hong Kong and you look at, across at the, at the center of Hong Kong and you see buildings almost starting to represent plant material. They grow out with such enthusiasm you know, up against the mountains, and, and the buildings look like they're these biological entities. You know. So I thought that it would be wonderful if we could give a sense that the building is actually growing from the earth. And in taking this very simple square floor plan, we created a series of, sort of uh, sheets on the, on the exterior of the building, each of which was independent on each side. And it, it came down and flowed into the ground. So the building has a very sort of uh, or, organic quality to, to it. There was an interesting thing about cost, though, and efficiency. Uh, the owner started out saying that it was correct that they made a very efficient and economic building. And one of the key issues where to place the hotel because it affected the structure. If you placed a hotel at the very top, you had to stiffen that building a lot more because it was very uncomfortable to be in a hotel during a, a hurricane or tornado. That's something that's rarely brought up in that these buildings do move. Exactly. And you have water sloshing around in sinks and mm -hmm. right. So a hotel at that height uh, was a bigger problem than an office because office you can evacuate your home. Your guests are really stuck there. So we studied the hotel lower down in the building and thinking that was the right thing to do from an economic point of view. But it's interesting, the owner was so concerned about that view from the hotel 
Remember, the peak in Hong Kong was 400 meters. This building was over 480. So that top part of the building, he wanted for the hotel, the spectacular views that you wouldn't get only below that. And so even though it cost more, because the structure was definitely costly to keep that building from moving too much, we put the hotel at the top. We had to make that change later in the design competition, because early on we had it below. Thinking we were very, very smart, putting the hotel below and saving lots of money. So the owner did, in that case, increase the budget to achieve what he wanted to. Well, here again, you have another iconic landmark building that is having a dialogue with another building. And in this case, that's uh, Caesar College II International yeah, Finance sure. Center. And what uh, what was your thought process? Uh, well, they put that goalpost, but they do form the gateway <laughs> to the harbor. Well, it's uh, quite striking because yeah. you have you have Kelly's building, which is in the middle of some action, and uh, there's not nearly as much going on on your side of uh, Although it's, it's improving because they're more residential and retail. Um, but they do actually work together. Well, you still have the dialogue, but over a longer distance. What, yeah. did, did as much thought go into your building there as it did into being next door to the Jim Mao building? Yes. The, the same attitude uh, took place. We knew that we were going to be relating to Caesar's building. These two buildings would be the sense of gateway to the Inner Harbor uh, and would be perceived as such as one came into the Inner Harbor. So, the relationship between the two buildings was, was carefully studied uh, as, at, at the point of departure. Um, but it's the same number, by the way. Oh, of course. And, and when we say that they're far away, they're how far from one building to the other? Quite a distance. Sorry, sorry. I would say approximately a mile. But the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about um, the Kowloon development, you know, Kowloon's, the Kowloon station is the first stop from the airport. It takes 18 minutes to get from the airport to the Calvin Station. And what is interesting now about development, particularly in Asia, it's all occurring over transportation nodes, as it should. And that, that is really pointing, I think, a, a finger towards the future of development. Well, and what we're not doing in the United States. Exactly, exactly. And, and that is uh, why I think uh, Right now you say that Calhoun doesn't have as much activity as Central does where Caesar's building is, but Calhoun will very quickly become extremely dense because it is all built around this, uh, the, that transportation hub and spaces. And one other interesting thing, by the way, is that that building has been leased and used by Morgan Stanley, as an example, before it's finished. They've actually broken it into two or three unit sections. So the first part of the building is under is in use for the rest is being built. It's very rare you see that in this country. And it's how far from completion? Oh, it's about two years. As we begin 2009, it's still two years away. It'd probably be probably well into 2000, end of 2010, I think, it's due to be. But, but it's been a catalyst, by the way, to Calhoun. One thing to answer your question, is that, like the Wall Street Journal ran an article saying that town was the catalyst for great growth in Calhoun, attracting major companies like Morgan Stanley, CS First Boston, uh, two there. So. Uh, I think Bill's actually right. It's going to, you're going to see a great more field of activity there as a result of that town. We seem to be seizing on a theme here in that uh, we've discussed two of your um, really uh, iconic projects, the Shanghai World Financial Center and uh, International Commerce Center that have some sort of interaction with another tall building, uh, whether it's next door or across the bay. Um, the big news, I guess, for your firm these days is the American Commerce Center in Philadelphia. Uh, which was officially approved back in November of 2008, uh, 1,200 feet tall to the roof and what, 1,500 feet to the top of the spire, roughly, and uh, on the order of 85 floors. And uh, the significance of this building is that um, taller than the Sears Tower, officially, uh, one of the tallest buildings in North America, depending on which building gets built next. Uh, and it's right next door to another iconic Philadelphia building, the Comcast building. It's true. And interestingly enough, Philadelphia, you should probably have it in one of your charts, because in Philadelphia, it had the tallest building in the world in 1901, which was City Hall. And um, it's still the tallest, largest masonry bearing building in the world. So I use that as part of our justification that, that uh, because a lot of Philadelphians are very conservative, and the thought of a super tall building was of less interest to them than it might be elsewhere. Um, but I pointed out that they were very bold in 1901 when they had this great structure finished and it became the catalyst to much of Philadelphia's development. 
And then in 86, when the height limits were lifted from the feet of William Penn, the top of City Hall, uh, to other, a greater height, it's led to all these super tall, but many times very tall, but it's not super tall. But the American Commerce Center will be a super tall building and will become the new, I think, image of Philadelphia, although it works quite well with Comcast. So the two, much like we discussed in Shanghai, play a role one with the other. And I think they're very effective together. Well, but this is not, this partnership has not gone off without some controversy, right? Well, no, I mean, uh, obviously the, the neighbors to this building are not as excited about such a super tall the building being their, their neighbor. And having their views <coughs> obstructed. Some of their views are. Some of actually views. very <laughs> sensitive to have great windows between the hotel, great space, which you call the windows. That's a fact of life. Hotel in, and an office building. That's a fact of life in, in cities, cities right? with high yeah. density, uh, high density yeah. tall buildings. Yeah, if you live on the block, somebody's going to build across the street, you really can't stop it. But this will, I'll tell you what's important about this project, because it's a hotel, has major retail, including marvelous food market for the neighbors. It brings safety and life at the street all around, uh, it's right now a parking lot. It has a marvelous hotel. It has a series of public space up throughout the building, uh, at the ground level, third level, and sixth level. Museum quality space in terms of the exhibit at the levels off this great open space. The open space is 19,000 square feet at the sixth level. Pretty amazing. Gardens that look out over the city. And then even higher at the, the, the uh, 490 foot, there's an outdoor terrace, gardens. So that the community can enjoy not only the shopping, the movies, and health club and hotel facilities, but public space that's stag that is staggered and vertically through this building and with easy access. So it becomes a great public amenity, not just an office. And coming soon to a city near you, do we know uh, the construction timetable yet? Well, obviously we're a very difficult financial Time. Um, there is one or two, there are one or two major tenants that are serious about the building. And should the one or two of them sign, this building will proceed probably earliest construction to start would be 2010, 2011, depending on the, the tenant's uh, approval. You are the guys who, who have to go out and sell these buildings. And part of what you do is, uh, and part of why you're so successful is that you have to uh, you have to come up with the concept, package it, sell it to the client, and uh, I mean that's that's it essentially. But you are specialists in going out there and ascertaining the client's needs and coming up with something um, culturally sensitive, uh, sensitive to its surroundings. And uh, describe that for me. I mean that's that is one of the best things that you do. I mean nobody does it better. What's the secret? Is there one? <laughs> the secret is intention. 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 I think that's that. that because if, if one begins with the desire to do it, then that becomes the entire focus of the design exploration. And you now the programmatic components that go into the building, obviously, are based on the desire of, on the part of our clients to include them or not include them. We'll make suggestions, but nevertheless, uh, they're pretty much running the show. But the manner in which the building tries to find a, a connection with its place in this context, and the manner in which the building becomes a representation of the civic realm, that is that is our responsibility. And that's what that's what we define as our role, and that's our primary focus. Has the business changed since the era of the Sears Tower, in that uh, you would build an iconic building and? Uh, not pay as much attention or concern to what was going on in the rest of town while I built my building and yeah. I've done what I'm yeah, supposed I to do. I think both the architects as well as the owners have taken a greater interest in the role and responsibility of these buildings as they, they are built in the cities. One thing I should point out that the American Commerce Center is also tied to transportation. We're, we're building a connection underground to the main concourse of the suburban station, which ties into three subways regional trains that end tie into the north-south metro line between New York and Washington. So this population is sitting over the best transportation in the city of Philadelphia. And therefore, and we add retail below grade into the concourses. So the building will be a vital part of the city and bring to the citizens from great shopping to all these wonderful entertainment activities to improve the quality of life in Philadelphia. And if you knew the area where it's being built, frankly, there was no nightlife, there was little daylight there. This will really change the city dramatically and contribute to it in an amazing way. 
I, I'd like to specifically respond to your question because I think it is a very good one. And in a way, our firm um, set about to uh, achieve this uh, with the tall building, uh, as improbable as it seemed in the 1970s, 1980s when we began. We started uh, very unlike smaller firms. We started with large projects. And, and Gene had, had been president of John Carl Warnicke's office. Uh, we were together there in that office. We, we were able to work with developers right from the beginning. And, and most of our practice was focused on the office building. Well, the office building at that time had very little concern, frankly, for issues of the civic nature. The office building was thought of by a lot of critics as being somewhat of a financial instrument of exploitation, is what it amounted to. And we set upon ourselves to try to develop strategies to find ways of creating the ability for the tall building to connect to its context, to be able to somehow act as a catalyst for the context. And we've gone through a lot of different strategies. Some panned out, some didn't pan out. We went through a whole classical period that we utilized. If you 900 North Michigan is an example of it. And um, we ultimately rejected classical strategies because they, buildings could not be built with the same sort of resonance or fidelity that the original buildings were. And so, uh, but we, our intention has always been the same. How do we find ways to make the all going to contribute to a larger context rather than itself. Thanks for that. Not corporate necessarily. It was all about designing by statistics. Area, cost per square foot, rent per square foot, return on investment. Bankers never even looked at designs, they looked at the performance. It was strictly the numbers. Strictly the numbers. And a lot of very bad buildings got built. And it was really what, I, what we found the Tom, I mean, we were very fortunate to have Tom Cosby be one of our first clients. He was one of the first people who cared about a building's design, maybe because he was from Chicago. Uh, and the quality of that design, his impact in the city, it allowed us to do a terrific project. And he wanted to see it built, even though the market wasn't great when he built it. And in a way, that got us started, because we, as Bill said, really believed in the tall building. And, and right from the start, the, the tall, uh, here's what we, we, we had a discussion when we started the firm. We wanted to do houses, museums, clearly say we want to do anything, we had to first be, be selected. But we decided that the, where America needed most attention was in the cities and with commercial buildings. Because they weren't being done by very good architects, frankly, for the most part. And the city influences most of our lives, we should really care about it. And so we chose that as the direction. We would go back in 1976, and it was really Tom Klesnick who gave us the chance to show that we could really do something special with the tall building and make it a real contribution to the city. So. And without without going into a grand analysis of 333 South Wacker, which so many people have done, let's reduce it down to what, uh, how how is this building your firm's statement about uh, about the skyscraper and its interaction with the city? Well, it was a statement made in 1980 and built and finished in 1983, and we've been working 25 years. But so this is the one that put you on the map. It, it put us on the map, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it was in regard to our intellectual exploration of <clears throat> the tall building, the beginning of our process is what it amounted to. The building specifically responded to the band of the river. The Chicago River at that point, uh, as you know, takes a, a sharp turn, and we wanted this building to be able to mark on the skyline that particular event within this, the, the fabric of the city. Uh, and so that, that curved belly of the building was an immediate, intuitive response. First seeing the site, it, was, it, it, it seemed like a, a perfect opportunity to reinforce it with that gesture. And so when we presented Tom Klutznik the initial models, that was what captivated him. Uh, and everything from that point on was sort of the development of it. But the, the building so clearly connects to its place. The building has been so well received by so many people, even cab drivers uh, I love, love that building, that in, in, in many respects, uh, despite all of the intellectualizing about the tall building, it may be our most successful example, but I think now the World Financial Center probably has taken it to, uh, another step. But I, I was really commending here, 
But as a developer, he chose this not for the financial reasons, as we stated at the beginning, because of the design. And, and I just thought that was quite special. And, um, and he was right. The building has turned out to be a great success and has accomplished all we set out to do. Going from there, and I've, I've asked this of a number of people, and it's, it's interesting to hear the takes of, of every individual I ask this, of every individual I ask this of, is that I don't know that any architect necessarily sets out to design the world's tallest building, design super talls, and it's just kind of a case of being in the right place at the right time and waking up one morning and all of a sudden you're putting in a proposal on fill in the blank. Uh, is that the way you feel? Our super t and our super tall buildings, do you want to continue doing them, or is it, are there other things you want to do? The answer is both. <laughs> there are other things we want to do, but we do, uh, are always excited about the super tall building. We're actually doing one taller now in China. And, and that is which one? It's called the Ben Yang building, it's an insurance company. And it will be um, 600 plus meters. So not as tall as some of the others being proposed, but it's certainly a super tall building. But height is never an objective in itself. Uh, dominance is never an objective, and frankly, beauty is never an objective. One never sets out to design a beautiful building, because if you do, uh, you're, you're always going to fail. Uh, one only sets out to solve a problem, to find ways of dealing with a building in a particular place, and if, if it all comes together and it ultimately results in a beautiful building, I mean, that's the ideal. We want, we want to create build, beautiful buildings, but we don't say, we want to build the tallest, we don't say we want to build the most beautiful. Uh, you're, you're really trying to solve a problem when you're, when you're dealing with any design situation. So every building is indeed a, a very individual response to a certain site. One, one final question that I just have to ask you is that uh, one of your more recent projects, uh, very successful and I think actually on budget was uh, a doghouse. Was a doghouse. Success what, is, success what is that? What is it? Successful, but not on um, budget. Over budget. Yeah, well over budget, and it was our budget that was succeeded. Uh, we were asked by the Animal Medical Center if we would do a structure for either a bird or a cat or a dog, and since the, I have a dog and the, the young man who helped me in the office had a dog as well, we decided to do a doghouse. But we want, didn't want to just do a doghouse to do a doghouse. We wanted to make this the most advanced thinking we could possibly make uh, uh, on the whole subject of a, a geometry and whatever. Uh, and so we used a marvelous uh, construction technique called com computer numeral uh, control system, CNC system, uh, systems, to create a uh, structure that has an absolutely spectacular geometry and it's all based on the movement of the dog that actually starts to spin around before the dog goes to, to rest. What kind of dog is the question that begs to be asked? Mid-sized dog. Mid-sized dog. Mid -sized dog. Mid -sized dog. Specifications. I have two large dogs. <laughs> yeah. It didn't qualify. This, this is for a boxer, a 50-pound boxer, or you know, up to the 80-pound. Or a wrestler. <laughs> you know you have the world eating out of your hand when every, every little project all of a sudden gets international attention. And, and this is this is the kind of project that you would only hear about on the observation deck. That's exactly right, and we never uh, we don't get any uh, real attention for t the big buildings, but this one has achieved oh, more attention than anything we've ever done in the past. So thank you both for coming by. This is like having Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and uh, Derek Jeter and uh, A. Rod all in the same room. So thank you so much for talking to us. It's been thoroughly enjoyable and I hope we see each other again. Well, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Cone Peterson Fox, one of the biggies on the observation deck.